Jesus is here, amen? amen. Powerful word this morning from uh, Brother Bobby and first word. I am the vine. Amen. Staying attached to that vine. I thought it was interesting. He said, not only is it growth, but it's also life. Amen. We have to stay connected, both to grow and to live in God. Amen. Prayers this morning. Um, Lift up a uh, lady by the name of Margie. She's a friend of Andrea Puccio. Uh, she's in Miami Valley Hospital. Needs a touch from the Lord. Um, the grandfather of Sister Tiffany, Matthew Bledsoe. Uh, he is also in the hospital. Um, they need to give him an MRI, but they haven't been able to keep him awake long enough to give him an MRI. So we ask that the Lord touch there and move. That 
they can find out what's going on with him. Amen. It's good to see Sister Brandy in the house this morning. Amen. But continue to remember the Burke family as they have a special need and God to move in that family. It's good to see Sister Carol back in the house this, this morning. Amen. God answers prayer. Continue to lift her up. Uh, continue to remember Chris Saunders. He's a boy, she, this is the boyfriend of Amber Brewer. Uh, he fractured his spine, needs a touch. It's good to see Sister Stella here this morning. Uh, she's been fighting migraines. Once again, the Lord moves. Uh, lift up the entire Brockman family. All of them are sick, as well as Sister Carmen. Uh, and can lift up Sister Joni. Uh, she was not feeling well this, week, this weekend either. We know a Lord who can touch. Amen. This altar is open for those who want to stand in the gap. Sister Elsie is very sick as well. Continue to lift her up. Amen. The altar is open. The oil is here. The elders are here. If you want to come forth for prayer, amen, as we take these prayers to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you. We thank you for the mercy and grace which you have bestowed upon us this day. Lord, you are a merciful God, a healing God, Lord Jesus. You touch in each and every situation. Glory and honor be given to you, Lord Jesus. In all things, we appreciate you. We glorify your holy name. You are a God of mercy and God of grace, Lord Jesus. We give you the glory and the honor of all things. We appreciate you. We thank you for who you are. Oh, Heavenly Father, move in each and every spoken and unspoken request. You are a healing God, a financial reporting God. Oh, you know all things. You see all things, Lord. Let forth a testimony come, Lord, how you again have delivered. How you again have prayed. Oh, Lord, when we see mountains move, we know that someone prayed for that heard our prayer, that you've moved in our lives. Jesus, each and every testimony, we give you the glory. We thank you for who you are. Heavenly Father, we love you. We appreciate you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory and honor be given. Oh, Heavenly Father, we love you. Oh, we feel your spirit, Lord Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus.
appreciate a praying congregation, Lord, where our brothers and sisters can come together in unity to pray and lift up that name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, several quick announcements um, this week. Uh, please remember to silence all cell phones uh, this morning. I don't want any more interruptions or any interruptions from uh, as Rex brings forth the word this morning. And also a friendly reminder, ladies, make sure your husbands have gone to the restroom before service starts. That way they're not interrupting service. Uh, and, uh, and only water is acceptable in the uh, sanctuary. So please leave any other drinks out in the, in the vestibule or in the basement. Amen. Uh, Tuesday is our church fast day. Uh, and in prayer here at the church at 6.30. Bible study on Wednesday. Pastor's been going through the book of Proverbs. Uh, it's been a really good study. Um, he, he's brought forth a lot of good stuff. Even this past week, he, he preached about money. And me, even being a finance guy, I'm still learning things. Amen? And thanks, Pastor. You gave me a, a lot of scriptures for our uh, offering scriptures as well. So uh, I appreciate that. I have a lot there. Well, uh, Thursday, the youth have their coffee chat at Thursday at 6.15. See a youth leader for more information about that. Men, we have prayer breakfast on Saturday. So please let me know when you're coming so I can make sure we have enough biscuits and gravy and eggs for everyone. Uh, again, that's uh, prayer at 8.30, breakfast at 9. Uh, we've been having some really good turnouts, some really good prayer. So uh, we want to keep that going through the summer. Amen. Under construction on Saturday. Uh, from 11 to 1, ages 7 to 11. Any questions, see, please, please see Sister Denise. And women, you have your cookout on s Saturday as well, 5 p.m. here at the church. There's a sign-up sheet up in the vestibule. Sign up to bring some goodies. Come out some, some fellowship there as well. Also, men, uh, the apostolic men's offering is due on this Wednesday. If you have not uh, donated to that, uh, please make sure you get your offering in either today or Wednesday. Uh, pastor has challenged us, challenged me. Uh, last year we were in the top, one of the top giving churches in the district. And he's asked us to exceed that this year and to move even further up on the list. So uh, I think, Pastor, you said on Wednesday, reach over to your neighbor, grab their wallet, and give like you always wanted to give. Amen? I... I can see Brother John right now reaching for Stella's wallet, and Stella's, Stella's giving $100, so somebody match that. Amen? Uh, and then men also, are, the men's conference is coming up uh, this August 23rd and 24th at the New Life Church in Dayton. So it's close this year. We can make it up and back in a day. Uh, look forward to a great turnout there. Brother Friend was here in March gave us his personal invita invitation to come. Uh, registration is open on the, on the uh, district website. It is a $35 registration fee. Don't let that hinder you. Um, if you need some assistance with that, please see Pastor. Uh, we, we can make arrangements. We want a good turnout. Uh, get everybody to go up. Great line of, lineup of speakers. Br Brother Rex talks about it last week. Brother Ken Gurley, his son-in-law, Pastor Tyler, uh, and Todd Johnson. Todd Johnson. Uh, great, great, powerful, packed speakers. You don't want to miss that. Uh, if our ushers will come forth at this time, our offering scripture today comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 12. It says, The hand of the diligent seek, excuse me, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Heaviness in the heart of a man make it stop, but a good word make it glad. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this offering for the gift and the giver, Lord. We ask that you move forth in this, to go forth to spread your word, to do all your will. In your name we pray. Amen. I will sing unto the Lord.
You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Oh, let's magnify him. He is truly worthy of it all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He's worthy of it all. All honor, all glory, all praise. Amen. Somebody had to tell me that. I've experienced that for myself. Amen. I've tasted and seen the goodness of God. Amen. He's never left me. He's never forsaken me. He's always been there right on time. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He's worthy. Amen. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, let's magnify him. Hallelujah. He's in this place this morning. Hallelujah. He's inhabited the praises of his people. Hallelujah. Such a presence of the Lord in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Thank you, Jesus. I'd hate to think where I would be if it wasn't for the Lord. Amen. I know it's an everyday battle. Amen. And we keep trudging on. Amen. But I know through it all, he's with me. Amen. And I'm so thankful for that. Amen. We will be in Revelations this morning. Our text will be Revelations 17, 1 through 5, and then Revelations 21, 9 and 10. Uh, I've done something a little different this year as far as my Bible reading plan, I usually start, sometimes I'll start in Genesis and work my way that way, and sometimes I'll start in Matthew and work that way, but this year I picked up a slip and it's got me everywhere, and I'm like, wow, so for about the last month I have been digging into Revelations, and as I dig into it, there is such a beautiful story of redemption. Amen. And you're thinking, well, this is revelation. This is prophecy. Amen. But redemption. There's such a beautiful story about redemption. I want to share that with you this morning. Amen. We're going to talk about the tale of two women. Amen. The tale of two women or the choice of redemption. Amen. And our text, I give honor to Pastor Sister Heidebaugh. I'm thankful and privilege to step behind this desk to share the word of God. It's something we don't think lightly. And uh, I just uh, hope to stir a heart this morning. Amen. This is what the word of the Lord says in Revelation 17, 1 through 5. And it says this, and there came one of the seven angels, which had seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious uh, stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. If you will, turn there with me. Move over to Revelations 21, 9 and 10. And it says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Amen. Tell of two women. You got the harlot Babylon and you got Jerusalem. 
the new Jerusalem. Amen. But in between there, there's a, a choice. There's a, such a beautiful picture of redemption. Amen. And I'm so thankful for the word of the Lord. I'm so thankful for the truth. Amen. That's what I want to share with you this morning. Just the tale of two, two women. Amen. If you put your Bibles down, let's extend our hands to the Lord and let's ask Him to bless this word this morning. Lord, we love and we praise you and we thank you. Lord, first of all, for your presence that fills this place. Lord, we thank you. Lord, for meeting us wherever we're at, Lord. For never leaving us nor forsaking us, Lord. We pray right now, Lord, let your word go forth, Lord. Open up every ear to hear, every heart. To, to receive and every mind to understand, Lord Jesus. We bind up every spirit that poses of going forth of your word right now, Lord, by praying and pleading your blood, Lord. Lord, that your will be done in this house this morning, your holy place, Lord. Have your will, Lord. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray and let everybody say amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <clears throat> the mighty God. You can be seated. I graduated from Lemon Monroe High School. Not, not Monroe High School, but Lemon Monroe. We put the lemon in Monroe, all right, where we came from. Uh, but I started out our English teachers. I had Miss Stewart, Miss Shager, who became Miss Stewart. Then I had Miss Porter. Then I had Mr. Orm. And he challenged us all those years ago, and I don't know if they still do this, to read a book by Charles Dickens, Mr. Warren did, called The Tale of Two Cities. And as I'm reading in Revelations, my mind goes back this 40, 40 years or whatever, back to Mr. Warren's class. And I can't help but think, maybe as Charles Dickens sat down to write this, I think he might have just have read here in a book of Revelations somewhere and came up with this tale. See, in 1859, Charles Dickinson published a literature masterpiece entitled The Tale of Two Cities. The book was an instant classic, and to this day, it contains the most famous opening literary in literary history. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was a season of light. It was a season of darkness. It was the spring of hope and the winter of despair. Those lines are so memorable because of the powerful contrast that they invoke. Dickens touched on the most common disparities that define the realities of our world. Good times and bad times, wisdom and foolishness, belief and doubt, light and darkness, hope and despair. The juxtaposition of so many opposites in a is a foreshadowing of the many Ways that Dickens tells his tale, the narrative of the story which takes place before and during the French Revolution and is set in Paris and in London, is carried by contrasting figures from contrasting worlds. Everything good in the book has an antithetical evil opposite. So it is that as the reader encounters love, hate, life and death, good and evil, as Dickens weaves the story of two different cities that is conveyed through the lives of individual characters who represent moral opposites. If you really take the time to dig into the book, the message Dickens' story is conveyed in the contrast between the characters. That is the story within the story. And it is in the closing chapters of the book of Revelation, God reveals a broad sweep of redemptive history to John. He does it in such a, the same way as Dickens related his story. Amen. God tells his story by sharing with us the tale of two cities through using two women. In God's story, two vastly different women represent two vastly, two very dissimilar cities. God uses the dramatic contrast between these two women to illustrate the scope of redemption, the finality of judgment, and the eternal choice that every person must make. Amen. The stories of the two women are told in different chapters, but they contain some startling similarities. Both stories start with an angel saying, come and I will show you. And they both, in both stories, John is then carried away in the spirit. Amen. But there are vast differences between where he is taken and what he has shown in these two cities. 
Amen. The first angel carries John away into the spirit into the wilderness. The wilderness has a very special meaning in prophetic literature. It is a dry, barren desert. It is a place of trial and testing. Amen. Good things rarely come from the wilderness. Blessings rarely flow. Amen. In the wilderness. Life doesn't spring up there. Green things don't grow there. It is dead. It is desolate. It is barren. It is the wilderness. And there in the wilderness, God shows John a woman who represents a city. She is given no proper name, but there was a name written on her forehead. It was mystery. Babylon the Great. The mother of harlots. Amen. An abomination of the earth. Here's the thing you need to know about the harlot Babylon. She was beautiful in a sensual sort of way. John describes her as being dressed in fine garments of purple and scarlet. Here the colors have significance. Amen. They represent the very expensive dyes that symbolized social class. Purple represents royalty. And only the royals wore purple, partly because no one else could afford it. The scarlet cloth was also extremely expensive because of that it was a symbol of wealth and prosperity. Only the rich and the famous could wear scarlet and purple. Amen. In addition, she glittered with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She has gone to great trouble to make herself look attractive. Amen. And in her hand, she holds a golden cup. And in this cup is the center of her seduction. For we learn that the angels, from the angel that through the intoxicating elixir in that cup, she has seduced the kings of the earth to commit fornications with her and has caused the inhabitants of the earth to become drunk with the wine of her fornications. That word fornication comes from the root word pornea. That's where we get pornography from. Amen. And as I look through some of the commentaries, it also breaks it down to say that they, pornea is wrapped all together. It's such a wide spirit. It includes the Jezebel spirit. It has basically, it describes anything immoral, anything that is anti-Christ. Amen. So this harlot is intoxicating because she has this cup. Amen. And the people that drink from it. It's, it is a very evil, a very bad, anything that's against Christ is more wrapped up in this spirit, this pornea, this fornication. Amen. See, with her sensual come hither spirit, she draws men and women to her, and she slowly and methodically tears away their inhibitions, seducing them to drink from the cup of her hand. But the thing about this harlot is that she promises is not what she delivers. She promises blessings, but she delivers curses. She promises prosperity, but she delivers desolation. She promises health, but she delivers disease. She promises wealth, but she delivers poverty. Amen. She, she promises the best of drinks, the sweetest of mind, the very nectar of life. But she delivers the foulest of poisons drawn from the dregs of despair and laced with the very substance of death. Amen. For the wages of sin is death. Amen. Her siren song, her seductive call is an invitation to one and all. She makes pleasure seem so immediate. She makes satisfaction seem so near. She thrives on the image of instant gratification. Her message is so well received because she is marketing the shortest path to happiness. Her emphasis, her emphasis is on the immediate. You can have it right now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to lay nothing down. You can have it no matter what. You can just have it. Amen. There are no concern about the future. There is no worry about tomorrow. There is only concern about the present. Her song is all about here and now. The pleasure of the present. It's all about self. Me, I, and myself. Whatever I want, I can do. Amen. She lives in the moment. She sells a shortcut to satisfaction. She softly whispers about present blessings, present prosperity, present pleasure. It's deemed to be far more important than the future cost of any may pay. Indeed, she operates much like the heart operates today. Amen. The cost of a few moments in her pleasure is minimized by the pleasure of, minimum, of, of instant gratification is minimized. When John saw her, he was amazed. Amen. 
But the angel asked, son, what are, you, what are you amazed about, John? Don't be fooled by her beauty. Don't fall under the spell of her seductive voice. Amen. Make no, no, make no mistake about it. Her companionship comes with a steep price tag. Much like the loan shark enslaves his debtors, she enslaves who, those who will surrender to her gentle and serene voice. And she is a cruel taskmaster. Behind that central facade, behind that thin veil of beauty, there is death and destruction. And those who fall into her open arms are immediately wrapped in brokenness, pain, and despair. Amen. Hers is the, the spiritual deception. Amen. She entices men and women to trade eternity for a moment of pleasure, to sacrifice the coming world for the present world, to trade eternal life for a never-ending death. Amen. It's all about the here and now. It's what can you do now. Don't worry about storing up treasures for yourself. You can have it now. Go ahead and keep up with the Jones. Go ahead, be busted, broke, and in despair. It don't matter. You know, what matters is now what you have here on this earth. Don't worry about the future. Don't worry about tomorrow. Amen? Anything that goes against the Bible is what this harlot's all about. But Revelations 18, 3 and 5 says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of her... Her kings of the earth have committed in fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, that ye receive not her plagues. To whosoever will hear, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. In the midst of this prophetic story, amen, of this seductively wicked harlot, a second voice cries out from heaven. A voice is directed to whosoever will hear. It cries with passion. Come out from among her. Don't fall under her spell. Amen. This is the voice of the Spirit pleading with men and women. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Save yourself. Amen. From this dreadful judgment that awaits this woman and all that have fallen under her sphere and her influence. Even to those who are caught up in her grip, those who have been intoxicated with her promises, the Spirit speaks of hope. Her bondage does not have to be permanent. Her influence does not have to extend to eternity. Her slaves are hers because they owe a debt that they cannot repay. But the Spirit speaks of hope and life. The Spirit announces the power of the cross. Amen. The virtue of the precious blood of Jesus. The Spirit decries the price has been paid. Come out from among her. Amen. That count was settled long ago on a hill called Calvary. Amen. At an old rugged cross. Amen. I'm thankful for that blood that flows from Calvary. That crimson stream of blood. Amen. It's the blood that covers a multitude of sin. It's His blood. Amen. That blots out all transgressions. It's the blood that covers it all. Amen. For indeed we are called forth to come out from this house. Amen. I indeed indeed there this morning there's a call going forth in this house. Amen. To the weak and the weary to the bound and the broken, to those who have been caught in sin snare. You don't have to stay there. You can leave it all behind. Amen. Come out from among her. Amen. I was reading one commentary and it was talking about being unequally yoked. Man, and a statement was made that absolutely blew my mind, Brother Blackford. He says you can sit on a church pew. You can fellowship with that person. And still be unequal, be yoked. Amen. This is when you get into the Spirit. Giving yourself to the Spirit. Amen. That things will happen. The chains will fall. Amen. You ever notice how why we sing so many songs about broken chains? Being set free. Amen. It's what the harlot does. She shackles you. She lays you up. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Keep you longer than you want to stay. Amen. Leave you busted. Leave you broken. Leave you beat up. Amen. But the Bible says, come out. You got a hope. You got that hope in Jesus Christ. 
you can leave it all behind and come out from among her. Don't partake in her sin so that you will not be subject to her judgment. Lay it down at the cross and let the blood of Jesus make you free. It's the blood. There's power in the blood. Amen. It's power in the blood. Amen. Now, sometimes I think we take that for granted, the blood. Amen. Pray and plead the blood over everything you can and believe it and know that God's going to work it out. Stand firm upon his word, declaring what his word says. Amen. Stand firm upon it. Amen. See, then suddenly the scene shifts. Once again, an angel comes to John, and we see John is carried away in the spirit. But this time, <laughs> instead of going to the wilderness, the spirit carries John to a mountaintop. Woo! Thankful for those mountaintops. Amen. So thankful for it. I was thinking about a, about a song. It says, plant my feet on higher ground. Yes, plant my feet on higher ground, though. Amen. I understand I got to pass through the valleys, but Lord, just something about that mountaintop experience. It gives me the strength to make it through those valleys. Amen. It gives me that direction that I need. See, the greatest contrast between the wilderness and the mountain, one represents bondage and despair. The other represents victory and hope. Woo! Thank God for hope. Thank God for victory. Amen. Amen. It was there in the, on the mountain that the Spirit showed John that heavenly city, the hope of the ages, that new Jerusalem. Amen. Like wicked Babylon, this holy city was also represented by a woman. Only this time, instead of the harlot, we find the bride. We find the bride. Revelation 19, 7, 8 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she would be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Once again, the woman is dazzling. She is absolutely breathtaking in her splendor. But there's a significant difference between her beauty and the beauty of the harlot. The harlot has arrayed herself in wealth and riches, amen, with all kinds of babbles and trinkets to increase her attractiveness, amen. She's painted herself up. She's put on everything she can to stand out. Look at me, to make herself look beautiful. But the bride possesses a single, honest, pure beauty, the kind of innocent beauty that the harlot has never possessed. She has made herself ready she has prepared herself for this moment. Amen. But her preparation is, did not involve the rich trappings of wealth and with its gold and jewels. Amen. Can I just pause here for a moment and say, the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added. Amen. You, we may not be rich, but we're rich in spirit. We're rich because he's gone to prepare a place for us that where he is we may be also. We got a mansion waiting for us where the streets are gold. Amen. I don't need all this material thing. It's all going to go somewhere else other than when I leave this place. I'm not even going to give it no thought. I hope not. Amen. But to know that we made it to heaven. Amen. Storing up those treasures when the harlot wants you to be so fixated on the material of this world. Amen. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but yet lose his own soul? Amen. I got heaven. We got heaven to gain and hell to shine. Amen. She made herself ready. Amen. She was arrayed in fine linen and clean and white. Amen. Unless we miss the point, John tells us her fine linen was the expression of her righteousness. Amen. She has arrayed herself, amen. See, here's the great contrast. The harlot and her seductive beauty embodied everything that the wicked in this world. The bride, however, is stunningly attractive, and she represents all that is right, all that is good, all that is holy, and all that is pure. Amen. She has kept herself. She has reserved herself. Amen. There are some things she will not do. There's some places she will not go. 
There's some stuff she's just not going to let come out of her mouth. Amen. She has separated herself from some things. She's lost a lot of friends and not thought twice about it. Amen. See, there are just some things she will not do. And she was not foolishly squandering away her virtue, but she was reserving herself for eternity. Amen. Take this world, but give me Jesus. Amen. Give me the cross. Give me the blood. Give me the word. Give me the fellowship with like precious saints. Give me the body of Christ. Amen. She was not foolishly squandering it. While the harlot promises liberty and freedom in this present world, the bride recognizes that the liberty of this world leads to bondage. Amen. And the pleasures of the immediate are shallow and meaningless compared to that heavenly award that awaits each and every one of us. Amen. She has determined to save herself for the bridegroom. Amen. She has resolved to keep herself pure and chaste. A righteous woman, a very sense, in the very sense of the term, a symbol of all that is good and innocent. Amen. The bride of Christ is composed of those who have answered the call of the Spirit, those who have come out from among her and have separated themselves from the harlot of this world. See, it's in this image of the church. She has kept herself pure. Her garment is unspotted. Amen. She has not mingled her purity with the tarnishing influence of this world. She has not wasted, watered down her commitment with the shallow, meaningless alliance of this life. She lives in a world, but she recognizes in her heart of hearts that this world is just not her home. Amen. Her treasures is in heaven, and she is living for a city whose builder and maker is God. See, and in a final move to clarity, clarify the complete and contrast between the harlot and the bride, we learn that she also caused the world to come and drink. Only she doesn't call them to drink from a cup filled with abominations. She does not call them to drink from the poisonous fountain of earthly pleasure. No, she calls the world to drink from the springs of living water. Amen. Living water. Revelations 22 and 17 says, And the spirit of the bride said, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Joining my voice with the spirit who calls all men to separate themselves from the harlot, the bride invites all who will hear the voice to come and drink freely of life everlasting. Amen. There is no strings attached to her drink. There are no hidden bondages in her invitation. Amen. There are no destructive abominations waiting in her cup. The bride only has the promise of life and life everlasting. The bride calls every thirsty man, woman, and child to come and drink from the riches of heaven and to experience the foretaste of life everlasting. Here are the here where the contrast reaches its climax. Here we see the whole picture: two cities, Babylon and heaven. Amen. Babylon and heaven. I had a conversation the other day, and somebody was asking me a question: Why are there so many churches? I said, Well, technically, the more I study the Bible, I understand there's only two churches: it's the harlot Babylon, and it's heaven, which is Jesus Christ. Two churches. You know, you can have a lot of beliefs and all that, but it all comes down to that one belief, the truth. Amen. And that's why the Bible says, taste and see. Try the Spirit. Make sure that you be in the Spirit. Amen. Because it will help you. The Holy Ghost will lead, guide, and direct you in all truths. Amen. Two women, a harlot and a bride. Amen. Two invitations, one to death and one to life. Here we see the bride as antithesis of the harlot where the sensual harlot entices you to invest yourself in the temporal fleeting pleasures of this life. Pleasures that last but for a short season and to leave you broken, busted, and empty. The bride invites you to come and drink freely from the springs of living water and from the fountain of eternal life. Eternal life. Living water. It is the fuel on which our physical bodies run and is absolutely necessary for our survival. 
Amen. It is the fuel which keeps our physical bodies running. Amen. The critical link between water and life provides a rich and meaningful emblem of the spirit in Scripture. That which is essential for physical life is used to represent that which is vital in the spiritual life. From the opening pages of the Bible where the Spirit of God is first portrayed in the act of creation as moving upon the face of the waters, the Spirit is characterized in terms of a fluid that is poured out, sprinkled upon, rained down, and flowing like a river, springing up like a fountain. Likewise, the psalmist often likens the human desire for God to thirst, comparing the inner desire of every heart to involuntarily compulsion that drives every person to seek out that life-giving refreshment that can only be found in water. It's water. Amen. And in the way water represents everything that we long for deep in our hearts of hearts. Perhaps it is Jeremiah that best established the significance of this water-oriented language. While he does not explicitly reference the Spirit, he points out that we need God in the same way that we need water for physical life. When people turn away from God, Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 2 and 13, that they abandon the fountain of living waters and choose instead to hoe hoe out broken cisterns. They can hold no water. Amen. That's what happens when you fall under the harlot's spell. You find yourself drinking from a cup that will never satisfy you. Using language that is especially meaningful in the culture that lives and dies by water, Jeremiah demonstrates that there is life and vitality to be found in the spirit that cannot be found anywhere else. Just like there is no substitute for water to sustain single Physical life, Jesus in harmony with the words of Jeremiah relates the spring of living water at two pivotal moments in his ministry. The first occurred in Samaria during a conversation that quite appropriately begins with a request for drinking water. Amen. And as the course of that exchange, Jesus introduces the subject of living water as we gently turns the conversation away from Jacob's well and less satisfying water that it contains to a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Amen. It was there at the well that he met a lady. Amen. And said, can I have a drink? And she questioned him. How can I have fellowship with you? Amen. How can I have fellowship with you? The beautiful thing about that was she was, he he explained to her that you can drink of this water of this well, but you're going to thirst again. But the water that I have, you will thirst no more. Amen. And what, what is so beautiful about that as well, she drank, she tasted it. She went back and brought back a whole city. Amen. That's the effect Jesus has. When you get that living water, you can't help but want to share that living water. Amen. And see, it is just as true today as it is ever. Our spiritual need for God is very much like our physical need for water. Without water, our physical body will die. And without the renewing of the Holy Ghost... We are all relegated to spiritual death. In keeping with the truth, the bride of Christ is seen at the end of Scripture, extending the same invitation, amen, that Jesus first extended to the thirsty. Come and drink from the water of life. Amen. And that is really the point and the contrast between the harlot and the bride. Amen. I know that story. I know that story. Amen. I made up my mind I was going to get baptized. I had been coming to church a long time. I had promised my wife, I'll go with you. Sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. Amen. Other things were important, like NASCAR and beer, gin and juice. Amen. Other things took priority. The world took priority. Amen. But I had made up my mind I was going to get baptized. Amen. Coming here, sitting through, I believe, with Brother Dillingham in revival services at Easter time. Is that right? At Easter time. I said, you know what, man? We, as a matter of fact, I remember even one time, Brother Tiller preached. 
I'm sitting back there where Sister Chessie's at. Man, if something hit him, he got to preach. I'm fighting emotions, Brother Robinson. I don't know what's going on. Hey, I've been in the military and all this. We just don't cry. You know, that's for sissies. That's for weakness. All right? No pain. You know, hey, we got to do what we got to do. All right? But, man, something hit Brother Tiller, man. I'm thinking, man, I want to cat hair up here. Boy, I'm fighting these emotions, wanting to cry. My wife leans over and says, that's the Holy Ghost. I'm thinking about him. So well, she's talking about him, and I'm fighting emotions. What in the heck is going on? It's the Holy Ghost. So I, I start, okay, man, I'm touched. I'm going to start seeking, see what this thing is all about. We come to those revival services and all that. Hey, Amen. I made up my mind it's going to get baptized. Oh, on the way home. All right. Well, you know what? I'm getting baptized tomorrow, Brother Anthony. Might as well have one more beer. Because once I do this, I'm done. We're sitting there. You got Charlie's drive through on the left. And I'm thinking by this time, I told my intentions to my wife. Here's the power of prayer. She gets to praying. All right. Conviction starts hitting. I didn't know that at the time. I just know, man, you know, well, should I do this or shouldn't I not do this? You know, I made up my mind. She said, turn left. It's going to go straight. But before I made that decision, Brother Anthony, I had this impression. Your tomorrow starts today. My tomorrow will start today. If I make a decision today, if I make a choice today, it impacts my tomorrow. Then as I look through Scripture, saying the promises unto you and to them that are far off. There's some decisions you're going to make here today, this morning. Amen. That's not just going to affect you today, but it's going to affect future. Amen. But instead of turning left, I went straight. And my goodness, did all heck break loose. It honestly felt like somebody had grabbed me. It was that grip of sin. I had made up my mind. I'm going to stop because, boy, if I'd have took one, God knew. It had been another 40. It had probably been another half gallon of gin. Been some juice. It had been something. Amen. And I would have never made it down that water. Amen. But my tomorrow started today. Amen. My tomorrow started today. Amen. But instead of turning left, I went straight. Man, and it was fight. It was on. Man, we wrestled for months. I got baptized in Jesus' name. But to get the Holy Ghost, it was still a battle because things were still coming. All right? Oh, man, you know what? You don't have to give this up. You don't have to separate, you know? I've got friends mad at me today still because I refuse to drink a beer with them. It's just one beer. It's one beer to you, but it's eternity for me. All right? Because I made up my mind. We go straight. I turn right. Go to the house. Right's all, home is always right. It's always right. Boy, we battled and we battled. Amen. But it was then that I realized there was a heaven and there was a hell. Amen. For all those years, that harlot Babylon, I had been serving her. I had been in her grip. And now here I was about to break that grip because I was determined I don't need this life no more. Hey Amen. I've been drinking all the world's got to come, but man, there's something I felt back there when it was the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Amen. That was absolutely changing my life. Amen. Amen. Changing my life. The Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. That thirst for that. I turned away from the thirst of this world and turned to the thirst for Him. Hallelujah. Amen. And that, brother, it's the greatest thing you could ever do. It is the greatest thing you could ever do. Amen. But I know that story. It's the heart of Babylon and it's life. If you'll stand with me, we'll close. Amen. Seeing the closing chapters of the book of Revelation, it's not just a story about the contrast between two women. In reality, it's a story and a contrast between two choices. And the stark reality that every individual must choose one or the other. 
Amen. It's a choice. Amen. I said a little while ago, there's really only two churches. Babylon, Jerusalem. Amen. Babylon and all this world. Amen. That's going to leave you broke, busted, and, and just left for dead. Amen. Amen. Or Jerusalem. In all its splendor, all its glory, all its gold. Amen. The song, the song that we came up on, I'm here to tell you it's worthy. He's worthy of it all, and it's worth everything that you give up. Amen. It's worth everything. See, we can either drink deeply of the harlot's poison and remain enslaved to the appetites of this flesh or come to the fountains of living water filled with the Spirit of God and drink from springs of refreshing that will ever satisfy your soul. Amen. You will thirst no more. I'm telling you right now, I have not thought one time about having a beer. I have not one time thought about everything because when God took it, He took it. Amen. He took all the desires from it. It's gone. Amen. That's why I try to encourage people when they first come to it because the devil going to keep coming at you. He's going to keep telling you, oh, come on. You may struggle. You may fall back a little bit. But amen, I'll tell you, if you keep being persistent, if you keep battling, if you keep raging that war on the floor, if you keep giving it over to Jesus, he'll see you through. He will take those desires away. Amen. I invite you this morning to come and taste of the goodness of the Lord here at this altar. Amen. Come and experience the richness of his presence. There is rest here. There is refreshing here. And there is freedom from guilt and condemnation in this altar, in this building this morning. Everything that your soul thirsts for, everything that the harlot fails to deliver, all that you need is found in the spring of living water. I invite you to come and drink. Pastor made the plea a couple weeks ago about this altar, the spring of water that comes from this altar. It's at this altar. I'm going to invite you to come and pray. Amen. You may be struggling with something. You may be trying. You may be fresh in this journey and trying to come over. But I'm telling you, if you'll keep drinking of that living water. Amen. If you'll just keep drinking of that living water. Amen. It's here. Amen. Matter of fact, the bartender Jesus Christ is here himself. Come and drink of those waters. Turn it over to Jesus. Give it to him. He'll see you through to the end. There's life and life everlasting here at this altar. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah.